We did a uh, video uh, recently on the onset of type 1 diabetes, not type 2, in middle-aged, uh, in, in adults. Uh, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, no, it does happen. Um, it doesn't happen very often, right? Well, we're going to look at that. Again, we looked at that in the previous video. It actually happens as often as it does in younger people. Uh, there's new information coming out about that. Now, why is that important? And what's the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? We'll talk about all of that in just a few minutes, but uh, first a brief introduction. Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R. -E uh, PrevMed, heart attack, stroke, uh, dementia prevention. Those things are hard to prevent. Um, the number one cause of all of those is car uh, cardiovascular inflammation. And the number one cause of that is uh, diabetes and insulin resistance. So <clears throat> actually, real quick, why is uh, insulin resistance important? We've covered this a couple of times, but if you're age 60, you're more likely than not to have insulin resistance. And if you, as you see here, if you live in the state of California, you're um, you got a one in one, one in two chance of having insulin resistance. And actually, obviously, there's some irony to that. You don't have to be in the state of California. The bottom line is insulin resistance is far more common uh, than we've thought. Yes, a lot of it's related to obesity, but a lot of it's just related to uh, aging. As you saw, as I showed a minute ago, if you're age 60, uh, you're more likely than not to have insulin resistance. I keep using these terms, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and type, type 1 diabetes. What's the difference? Why does it matter? Uh, all of them can make your blood sugar go high, and all of them can uh, cause cardiovascular inflammation. That's true, but it does matter. Um, <clears throat> let's just talk for a minute, again, about type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. First of all, uh, a lot more people have type 2 diabetes than type 1. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, type 1 is far more aggressive. Um, let's just talk for a minute about, about that. If you look it up on the internet, you'll see, oh, type 1 happens usually before age 15. Again, not true. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Just cover that. Um, <clears throat> and the Type uh, 2 only happens in adults. Uh, that's quite, not quite so true either. We're beginning to see that in uh, teenagers even. But here's the major difference, which we'll cover uh, a little bit more deeply. With type 2, you're resistant to insulin. You still make insulin. With type 1, you're not making insulin anymore. It's a far more aggressive, uh, far more severe type of uh, disease. Uh, type 1 uh, patients will struggle with blood glucose getting over 200, 300, 400, and even 500. Uh, that can be lethal. The, the onset for type 1 tends to be abrupt. It tends to be something where you've got an autoimmune. Again, it's that whole thing of the body taking friendly fire, the immune system getting confused and attacking part of the body. This time, the beta cells, the islets of Langerhans, um, don't worry about those technical terms, but the parts of the pancreas that create insulin. So those uh, antibodies create that part, those, uh, that pancreas, and you're no longer making insulin. With uh, type 2, it's much more of a gradual onset. Both of them, again, raise the blood sugar. Both of them cause cardiovascular inflammation, and uh, therefore both of them cause problems with the kidneys, eyes, and heart that together they are the major causes of death and disability in this country. So obviously we need to focus on this and understand it a little bit better. Here's a diagrammatic uh, look at this. Type 1 diabetes, uh, the bottom line, the problem here is that the pancreas is not making insulin. So your blood sugar goes up and that blood sugar doesn't go into the muscles. Here in type 2 it's a different mechanism. Um, your pancreas is still making uh, blood sugar, I mean, making insulin, but uh, your muscle cells have begun, become resistant to 
that insulin. <clears throat> now we talked about, uh, you may remember in the discussion of the case, uh, in the other video, I brought up a question there at the end and didn't answer it. The question was, uh, so if you've got a patient, how do you tell the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Here comes uh, a good section for the biochemistry or biomedical genetics geeks. So, <clears throat> it's a thing called C-peptide. What is C-peptide? First of all, what's a peptide? It's a uh, it's an incomplete protein. You know, a protein is a sequence of amino acids put together that, that forms into a, a form which is used for uh, different ac biological activities like enzymes. All, all enzymes, for example, are, have a core of um, a protein. So the amino acid sequence, by the way, is... Uh, created by what? The DNA sequence. It gets transcribed from DNA to RNA. The RNA goes to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is like the factory uh, part of the cell. And then, uh, then the endoplasmic reticulum uh, translates that RNA to uh, protein. So here's the amino acid sequence for insulin, but it's called pre-pro-insulin. Why is that? Because there are, th there are actually three sections contiguous in this sequence. The beta chain, the, the, the B chain, the alpha chain, and the C peptide in the middle. So what happens is this protein folds over the A and B chain <coughs> linked together and the C-peptide uh, is cleaved off and um, is later on destroyed. So guess what? That provides us with a great way to diagnose whether or not someone is making insulin. If you find C-peptide in here, in the person's uh, bloodstream, you are finding um, evidence that they made their own insulin. I mean, even in diabetics where you're giving insulin, you can measure for C-peptide. Now, <clears throat> why is that important? Well, again, that's important for a lot of these, most of these adults that are getting diagnosed with type 2, di quote, type 2 diabetes, and then it turns out to be type 1, they find out by measuring C-peptide. They, they get very high uh, glucose values. This turns out to be much more aggressive than your regular type 2 diabetes. They take a, a C-peptide level and find that it's uh, little to none. And then they realize, oh, this is a type 1 diabetic, even though it happened later in life. So <clears throat> that's the other thing. We cover this in another video that um, we always thought of uh, type 2 diabetes as a juvenile. I'm not going to get the... Um, the video on that piece. We always thought it was a juvenile disease. And then what we're finding out now is no, it's not just a juvenile disease. People aged 30 to 49 have an incidence for type 1 diabetes just as high as 15 to 30 and even 0 to 15. It's just that we don't think of type 1 diabetes when a 50 year old develops diabetes. We automatically think type 2. Again, the problem with that is we, you can grossly undertreat that for quite a while. And that happens uh, quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting. When you start to look at it, uh, we're developing a lot better focus on how to find uh, risk for type 1 diabetes. Um, this is an article from the American uh, Diabetes Association um, meeting in Chicago in 2013, uh, they're doing a lot more uh, a lot more research into when does this happen, who is at risk. Uh, here are a couple of things to note about it. Number one, um, they've started looking at um, 
uh, first family members, family, um, there was always the assumption that this is genetic and therefore people in the first family um, uh, were much more likely to get it. They're finding that's not true. Um, <clears throat> although they're finding um, a lot of information about the risk, they're not really finding a lot of information about um, uh, how to prevent it. So they're finding out who's susceptible, but they're not figuring out how to make that, keep that from happening. Jay Sosinski uh, at the University of uh, Miami developed and is working with a predictive um, formula. That includes BMI. In other words, if you're heavy, your age, your C-reactive, I mean your C-peptide. Remember we talked about C-peptide just a minute ago. So you start looking at people that are heavy, they are young, and they've got little to no fasting C-peptide. That's a greater risk for uh, type 1 or what we used to call juvenile diabetes. In other words, an eight-year-old with a normal two-hour glucose uh, for an adult, for example, if an eight-year-old has a 120, 130, 135, they're going to be far more likely to have uh, to be at risk for type 1 diabetes than, a, and, than an adult at 150. So again, you start looking at that adult and you start thinking that's going to be more likely to be type 2 if they do develop diabetes. Um, <clears throat> a lot more interesting uh, information about this. There, uh, one thing that we you begin to realize as you start looking at this uh, issue is that we're so behind in this area in America. Think about how difficult it is to look at this in third world countries. Huge issue. Um, again, I'm going on. Thank you very much for your attention.